Hello everyone, and thank you for joining our workshop. On behalf of the Sineve Family Foundation and Community Education Services, I am pleased to welcome you to this vir the virtual workshop this evening. My name is Amy Tatterton. I'm the Director of Learning and Connection at the Sineve Family Foundation, and my pronouns are she, her. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Sitsika, the Pakani, and Gainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. The Sineve Family Foundation is an operating foundation based in Calgary, Alberta, that aims to improve education, employment, and housing outcomes for autistic youth and adults. Our vision is that autistic adults live, learn, work, and thrive in their communities and realize their desired futures. We operate a collaborative space called the Ability Hub, where we develop programs and offer services and supports that help people achieve their goals. Our mission is to reduce barriers and enhance opportunities for autistic youth and adults by identifying targeted areas of need, incubating innovative solutions, sharing promising practices, engaging community, and informing systems change. For more information about our programs, services, supports, and resources, please visit our website at sinevefoundation.org. Sineve is grateful to have a long-standing partnership with Community Education Services, collaborating to deliver quality education opportunities and information to our shared communities. Our host and technology expert tonight is Laura, who will ensure everything is running smoothly. To best support her and our presenters this evening, I will go over a few housekeeping items. Please use the chat option located on the right side of the screen in lieu of the Q&A for any questions you have during the presentation. Please choose the option host and panelist so that both our presenter and Laura can see your questions as to not miss anything. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation for presentation flow and continuity. The presentation is being recorded and will be available on the CES website. And if you have any technology challenges, please direct your question to our CES host, Laura, and she will help you out. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for this evening. Dr. Heather Brown was originally trained as an elementary school teacher and is now an associate professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Alberta where she helps current and future educators understand how to best support neurodiverse students in the typical classroom. Dr. Brown earned her Master of Education in Educational Psychology and has a PhD in Speech and Language Sciences from the University of Western Ontario. She is also an autistic professional who studies autism and her Aiden lab aims to uncover strategies to support the academic achievement and overall well-being of autistic children, youth and adults. By doing so, her research is poised to empower autistic individuals to be more self-confident in their neurodiversity and to develop a better understanding of the factors that most support their well-being at home, work and school. Supporting Heather's presentation and the discussion this evening is Dr. Shane Lynch. Shane is a registered psychologist and director of innovation and evaluation for the Sineve Family Foundation. He is responsible for the design, implementation, and evaluation of the programs and services offered to the community. Prior to coming to Sineve, Shane was in clinical practice for over 20 years, serving individuals, families, schools, and agencies as they supported individuals on the autism spectrum. And with that, I'm happy to pass the mic over to Heather to begin her presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you for that really uh, uh, kind welcome. Um, so, 
thank you to all of you who are here. I have to say, I teach online a great deal, but I am not used to teaching online where I can't see anyone's faces. So it is a bit weird. I feel like I'm in my whole like house all alone, just talking to my computer, but I know that's not actually happening, but that's what it feels like. <laughs> so uh, with, uh, without further ado, uh, or too many more tangents, let me start my presentation. So today I was asked to talk to you a little bit about what it means to uh, experience well-being or to thrive with autism. And to do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, as well as what the current research suggests about how to best support our ability to uh, thrive. So as you can imagine, or as you might guess, rather, that is me and my family when I was very, very little. And so I was born uh, quite a number of years ago, so those pictures look quite old. But anyway, yes, that's me and my family. And what's really weird about that one picture, so I don't know if you can tell, but in that one picture, I'm like laughing uproariously, and yet my brother, he like barely has a smile on his face. Well, so like seriously, what was happening is that the photographer was working so hard to make me laugh that, and so I was, I or to make him laugh, but I thought it was hilarious because he was, he was being hilarious, but my brother was very unimpressed. So that is the resulting picture which paints a pretty good picture of my early years, honestly. But I said not too many tangents, and that was probably too many, but regardless, let's go on. So imagine that it's the late 1970s, and that there's a village in rural Ontario where I grew up that's so small it doesn't even have a traffic light. Now, imagine that all of the women in this village have gathered at a small church a short walk from home for a special brownie potluck dinner. So everyone in my community has all gone to the church to have this wonderful potluck dinner. Now, imagine that there's a little girl in a brownies uniform who's staring at this long line of potluck items before her. And she chooses nothing. Because this little girl is unable to eat almost any of the foods that she's offered. She eats only Cheerios with milk for breakfast, toast and peanut butter for lunch, and macaroni and cheese for supper and she eats it every single day. Now, imagine that the caring adults around her notice that the little brownie is eating nothing. And so they say to her, don't you wanna eat? But this little girl who can't be more than five or six years old has learned one lesson very well. There is something very wrong with her because she doesn't like to eat. She has seen and heard and endured endless battles to eat, endless trips to doctors and specialists, endless conversations about what is wrong with her? Why won't she eat? So when the likely well-meaning mother asks the little brownie why she isn't eating, that brownie instantly experiences intense shame. And that causes a spectacular meltdown because this little girl struggles to regulate even through the simplest of emotions and shame was well beyond her ability to cope. Sorry, there we go. So my biggest obstacle to living well is not my autism. It's actually my extremely fragile mental health and my experience is not unique. So, Crib and colleagues in 2019 interviewed parents and their adult children with autism about the extent to which they felt being autistic affected their child's current and future life. The parents and the adult children, adult autistic children, both agreed that co-occurring mental health issues were the biggest obstacle to their futures with reports of severe cases of anxiety and depression. Swedish, Swedish researchers examined the medical records of over 50,000 individuals with autism, and they found that autistics are seven times more likely to engage in suicidal behaviors compared to controls. And this is an, obviously an incredibly sad story, but what's most important to remember here is that there is a tragedy that comes with autism, but not because of what we are, but rather because of the things that happen to us. Now, I know that's a bit depressing, so let me reassure you, there is a brilliant end to my story. 
I do survive the 80s, the 90s, and the turn of, turn of the millennium. It was super hard. It continues to be hard. And there are still a lot of very, very dark days. We didn't know a lot about autism when I was little, and I didn't even receive my autism diagnosis until I was an adult. But yet here I am, a professor at the University of Alberta, and more importantly, I'm an autistic professional who studies autism. And I want you to see the slide of some of my many awards and achievements because I want to offer you hope that no matter how hard it is for you right now, it can get better. So today I really want to think about or chat about what does it mean to experience wellness or what is autistic wellness? And so I'm going to start by covering these sort of four general areas. I'm going to talk about what thriving or wellness or flourishing or quality of life looks like for everyone. And then I'm going to talk about what it mean, what we might take from some of these models or some of these ideas and how they apply to people with autism particularly. I also tend or I almost always uh, use um, identity first language. So that means autistic person because there is so much research suggesting that most people on the autism spectrum, at least those who are able to respond to such surveys, prefer that type of language. However, I recognize that not everyone does, but please understand that if I say the word autistic person or person with autism, I am doing it as a sign of respect. I prefer autistic person, but every once in a while, you'll hear me do the other. So what is wellness? What does wellness mean? What do, we, what do we mean when we're talking about wellness? Well, the first thing we know is that wellness or well-being is not simply the absence of negative function. Instead, it's something more. Or in other words, a lack of negative affect or depression or loneliness or insecurity or illness is not the same thing as having positive affect or happiness or social connection or trust or wellness. And so if we're overly focused on anxiety and depression, we're not necessarily, or minimizing anxiety and depression. That's not the same thing as learning what it means to be well. So there's, I'm actually gonna cover as, as, as ridiculous as it may sound, I'm actually gonna describe three different models of well-being because I wanna pick and pieces out of each of them throughout this presentation. So just very, very briefly, I promise not to bore you too much with boring academic stuff, but very briefly, what do we mean? What are, what are these theoretical models that I'm referring to? So what does it mean to thrive? Well, one model developed by Benson and Stales is called thriving. And they suggest that in order to thrive, you need to have sparks, opportunities, and a voice. And so sparks is this idea of having a passion, opportunities is opportunities to develop these passions, interests, and then having a voice is this idea of autonomy or feeling empowered. Uh, even more famous model of well-being, or almost the, one of the first models we've had of well-being, was this idea of flourishing. And so Seligman, for better or worse, founded positive psychology, and he this is one of the most research, well-researched models. And they call it the PERMA model as an acronym based on the first five letters. But basically, they suggest that well-being has five pillars. So positive emotions, or basically your subjective sense of whether or not you are happy or content or experience joy in every given moment, but, overall, but also overall. The next one is engagement. And that actually refers to Chi Senkmihai's notion of flow, or intense concentration, absorption, and focus. And obviously, it's highly relevant to people with autism. The third is called positive relationships, which is often defined as having a strong sense of connection with others in the community. But this is often oper operationalized different among, differently among people on the spectrum, such as when we prioritize um, the development of, of a few close friends. So meaning is another important pillar. It refers to that having a sense that one's life has direction, purpose, and value. And then the last one, accomplishment, which is very similar to Ryan Adisi's self-determination theory, which states that the feeling of confidence or working to achieve mastery is a core human need. 
So these are generic well-being models. These are well-being models that the researchers like to suggest apply to everyone. And maybe they do. But it's also possible that these models don't necessarily apply to autistic individuals. And that's what we're sort of going to explore a little bit today. Or it's not that they don't apply. It's more that they sometimes look different. So to a G, so one researcher um, has written most recently that to understand autistic well-being, we have to understand the kinds of things, events, feelings, activities, or pursuits, persons, and so on, are making a co positive contribution to our lives. So now that I've sort of given you sort of a brief overview, just a very brief sort of taste of what these different models look like. Let's look at these sort of three areas. Um, and the first one is around positive identity, belonging, and connection. So here you see what is called the constructivist principle. It's a very famous principle that is talked about a lot in education. And basically what it states is that what we believe about the world is constructed through our conversations or our stories about the world. So many, many people will say that in this way, what we know and what we create are interwoven. In essence, the stories that we choose to tell have the power to affect how we come to view ourselves and our circumstances. And so researchers describe how they are, quote unquote, faithful, these stories. What, what does that have to do with autism? Why am I talking about this? Well, it has to do with the stories that we tell ourselves about what autism is. And so the medical model has this definition of autism, which rests on two fundamental assumptions. The first is that you have to assume that there is one right, normal, or healthy way for human brains to function. And the second is that if your neurological configuration and functioning somehow differs from this standard dominant normal, then there's something terribly wrong. So if I reflect back onto my experience of that little brownie melting down, why is she melting down when a, when a mother simply asks her, does she want to eat? Well, because she's already internalized, even at that very young age, several negative messages. She's internalized the idea that she's bad, that she's overly sensitive and overly emotional, that her needs, especially her sensory needs around food, are unreasonable that she was unlikable, that she wasn't normal, and that I had to change. And in fact, that was my mother. I love my mother, so please forgive me, but that was one of her favorite things to say about me as a little girl because that was the messaging that she had been told, that here was this daughter who isn't behaving properly and she needs to change. And so it's these types of internalized beliefs that coupled with the environmental stressors in my world that led to my eventual anxiety, panic attacks, shame, depression, meltdowns, and even further trauma. In fact, my anxiety disorder is necessary for my survival because I've had to learn to become hyper aware almost 100% of the time in order to sort of successfully hide and suppress my natural autistic tendencies. So wherever I am, whether I'm at home with my family or at work or at school, I tried to mask my weird and attempt to pass as quote unquote normal or neurotypical. And so basically, I believe that the problem is that autistic people are taught that we are broken and that who we are naturally is not okay. And being taught that message is absolutely devastating to your mental health. So, Batima Patel wrote in 2020 that the medical model has created stories of autism in which autistic people are inherently inferior to non-autistic people, that autistics lack something to fundamental to being human, and that autism is something to be cured, fixed, controlled, or avoided. The other problem is that these deficit frame descriptions of autism often miss the strengths that are also associated with it. And while many of us do have more challenges than our so-called non-autistic peers, the overall well-being of autistic children, youth, and adults, and their families 
is undoubtedly being harmed when we frame autism in terms of deficits alone. So what would be the alternative story? We're not gonna use the medical model. Well, for too long now, we have used the metaphor of a computer to understand how our mind works. But the more we study the brain, the more we understand that it functions much less like a computer and much more like an ecosystem. In fact, there's this Nobel Prize winning biologist, Gerald Edelman, who wrote that the brain is in no sense like any kind of instruction machine, like a computer. Instead, each individual brain is more like a unique rainforest, teeming with growth, decay, competition, diversity, and selection. And in fact, this metaphor of brain forest is actually a really excellent metaphor because it really describes more accurately how the brain responds to trauma by redirecting growth along alternative neurological pathways. And it also helps to explain how quote unquote genetic flaws bring with them both advantages and disadvantages. So neurodiversity refers to the simple fact that everyone's brain is different. If you look at any human and you assess them on any, uh, if you try to assess them on every possible skill that any human could possibly have, I guarantee that there will be some, every single person will have extreme weaknesses in some skill area. It's just the way it works because all brains are different. There is no, there is no brain that is perfectly able to do everything perfectly well. So this idea of the neurodiversity paradigm is, the neurodiversity paradigm as opposed to the medical model rests on entirely different assumptions. And so the, the neurodiversity paradigm would suggest that the diversity of brains is valuable that the idea of a perfectly normal brain is a social construct. In other words, no brain can be perfectly normal on every variable that we could test it on. And then the last thing that the neurodiversity paradigm is founded on is this idea that the power inequalities and stigma that is experienced by neurodivergent peoples mirrors the, those types of social dynamics that, we, that other minority identities experience. So First Nations peoples in Canada or the LGBTQ, I'm sorry, I can't do all the letters, but gender diverse individuals, people of color, all of these people are experiencing many of these systemic barriers that people with autism are experiencing that have nothing to do with our actual ability. So I really love this quote um, about how neurodiversity, I really like, um, so I don't have, I don't have the correct, so Judy Singer said the one that's on your screen, but there's another quote that's very similar. So let me read you the one that's very similar. So this one says, neurodiversity may be every bit as crucial for the human race as biodiversity is for the life in general. For who can say what form of wiring will be best at any given moment? And I actually love that, the way that's framed because it, it, I, I certainly love the comics. So I am so hypersensitive to sensory input that I'm going to be the person in a, K, uh, in a, in a prehistoric world that where we all lived outside and where dangerous animals could uh, attract us at any moment, I would have been the person that was gonna hear that dangerous animal. I'm the person who's gonna wake up out of a dead sleep and hear it because we never know what types of skills are gonna be most valuable at any given moment. And we have no idea how the world may change and therefore require different skills. Now, one of the big complaints when we talk about neurodiversity will be from uh, families or individuals who say, but I experience my autism as disabling in some aspect. And so please understand that the term neurodiversity is not an attempt to whitewash suffering undergone, that are, are undergone by autistic people, nor is it to, uh, an attempt to romanticize conditions which cause an individual great suffering. Instead, the point of neurodiversity is that it allows us to acknowledge, appreciate, and be grateful for the richness and complexity of both human nature and of the human brain.
So when we think about the story of autism and we think about the message that are internalized, we need to really start thinking about the fact that autistic people desire to be seen as having positive attributes, strengths, and agency beyond disorder or disability. And that we must put in much more effort into research and practice to acknowledge and document the positive experiences of autistic individuals. So people with autism, we have a large number of strengths gifted to us by our neurology, but we need to do a better job of acknowledging the strengths and abilities of, of acknowledging those strengths and abilities. And we also must recognize that these strengths represent legitimate and important ways of being in the world. So I'm going to take just a quick drink, give you a quick time to process and I'll keep going. So I gave you a brief overview about why it's important to be able to see autism as more than just deficits or more than just a disability and how that relates to positive identity and positive mental health. But now let's talk a little bit more about belonging and connection. So um, Webster and Garvis uh, conducted a qualitative study on successful autistic women. And one of the, this was one of the quotes from one of the women in that study. They said, I'm of the opinion that most people on the spectrum do really, really well. I'm, but I'm, I'm surrounded by people on the spectrum who are fine with relationships, they've got jobs, and their lives are going on swimmingly. I think that's a really important point because often, too often, what we're surrounded by are all the negative stories about all the ways in which autistic people are not experiencing well-being. But here's a really important counterpoint that says, you know what, maybe those stories are just not being told. So remember when I told you that Seligman had this relatedness, this idea that um, your connection to the community, having a strong sense of connection with others in the community is really important for all of us, but that that might look differently among autistics. So, for example, they might prioritize the development of a few close friendships, like I said before, or they might highly value their relationships with animals. But what's really important, uh, I think, uh, to say first about relationships and autism is the fact that we do want to have a strong connection. We do want to have positive relationships, and we often get experience great well-being when we find those individuals. So in this particular study by Lan et al., autistic young adults in this study offered rich descriptions of their positive well-being reflecting their unique individual differences and a strong sense of connection with others in the community and so they had this sort of overarching theme of the whole study was this idea that we are different but we're connected Certainly in my own life, I have often prioritized the um, animals or the relationships with animals. Um, so those are obviously both pictures of me. The, the upper one was my um, first cat. His name was Turkle. And then in the bottom one, I'm obviously at some kind of a horse day camp thing. But anyway, uh, my point here is that um, autistic use often involve intimate connections or often view intimate connections with animals as genuine friendship. And they may even suggest that these friendships exceed the value, at least for them, or in some cases for them, they exceed the value of some of their human relationships. And why might that be? Well, non-judgmental, sensitive, and always available for comfort and support, animals often help autistic individuals cope with stress, they provide companionship, and they give you a sense, a shared sense of unconditional acceptance. Another aspect that I have found particularly important for my own life, which is also borne out by research, is this idea of mentors and guides. So back to that Webster and Garvis study, in that one, many of the women spoke about the influential people in their lives who had believed in them and subsequently enabled them to believe in themselves. And so these influential people often included family members, university professors, employers, romantic partners, friends and coaches. 
And they were viewed by these women as individuals who possess knowledge, perspectives, and critical information that they personally felt that they were lacking. The women had trust in these individuals to help them by giving them the input that they needed to act in a specific situation or to improve their skills for further action. More importantly, these influential individuals instilled the women with a belief that they could achieve goals and be successful in different aspects of their lives. So that really resonated with me when I was first sort of going through that information. So in this picture you see over here, that is a picture of my dad. He's out here visiting me and we're obviously, well, I think the whole family's out here, but regardless, my father's out here and we've gone hiking or what have you in the mountains. I found that my dad has been an incredibly helpful support, especially managing the sort of executive functioning challenges of my life. And obviously I'm much better at it at it now at 45 ish than I was when I was uh, even in my 20s. But regardless, that support or it hasn't changed because while over time I've gotten better at sort of managing these effect um, executive functioning differences, my world has simultaneously gotten more and more complicated, requiring me to have more and more executive functioning skills. And so I just I, I just I can't um, thank my father enough for being willing. Often what I need him to do more than anything else is help me think something through. I need him to just talk it out with me and just allow me to consider multiple options and allow him me to lay out all of the details and then to sort of help me work my way through the, the details to understand the path to go forward. And, and I often thought throughout my life that I should learn, be able to ever learn to do that myself. Like I thought that was the goal of being an adult, but now I don't think that that will ever personally be something that I can do. The, the anxiety that I'm managing, the tasks that I'm managing, the demands on my system, they're so intense that I just need to sort of accept that talking it out is just the best strategy for me and not something necessarily that I need to feel ashamed with. Another really good example that's on the screen is my friend Veronica, who's in the bottom left. So I actually met Veronica when I was doing my um, grad school. She was actually assigned to me as one of my mentors in this fancy autism research training program that I had been in. Basically, it was a program designed to help uh, um, grad students specialize in autism. So she was assigned as my mentor. And I mean, that was sort of random. I mean, I kind of got to choose, but the fact that she took me on was pretty random. But what was what but what was really cool is what happened after that. So not only did she support me during my PhD, not only did she serve as an examiner during my doctoral dissertation, she actually ended up being my reference. She ended up being my reference for the very job that I got. She was my reference for the U of A. And then once I got here, she continued to act as a mentor. She continued to help me guide and understand this incredibly complicated world that I seem to be existing in. And Again, if it hadn't been for her or people like her, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing today. It's really important to understand that fitting in and belonging are two very different things. So fitting in means that you change who you are in order to be accepted. Belonging means that you're accepted just exactly as you are. And too often, People with autism are only taught that we need to fit in and we're never given the opportunity to belong. So what do I mean by that? I told you a little bit about camouflaging in an earlier slide. Camouflaging is this idea that I'm trying to basically hide my autistic, obvious autistic traits, like maybe I'm gonna hide my stims or maybe I'm gonna hide my emotional dysregulation or the fact that I'm really upset. And what we find or what people report is that this type of camouflaging and masking can be really exhausting. And so they, the participant said, it's mentally exhausting, constantly having to be something else, literally never being able to be myself and kind of sad too, I guess. And then another participant in a different study said, constant overthinking of possibilities of what to say, how it will come across, what others are not are and are not saying, the connotations of every word, the sentence structure, the emphasis, the body language, as well as everything else, combines into a giant's matrix of thought. And it's really, really true. We put too much of the burden on quote unquote fitting in on autistics. 
as and and that can be so draining and so difficult for our mental health now i'm not suggesting that we don't all need to learn to uh, exist in our different social worlds. Because of course we do. We all want to develop skills. We all want to uh, be successful. But when you're also trying to hide who you are, when you're trying to suggest that who I really am isn't good enough for you to see, well, that's what's so damaging. That's the kind of thinking that we want to try and help autistics to be able to move out of because it's not their fault that they got there the reason we get here is because people point it out to us people say you got to learn this and you got to learn that and you got to remember that and you got to do it this way and so what other choice do we have but to try and create these sort of gig this sort of gigantic sort of hyper vigilance and what, what we end up what we know is that when you push in a nervous system so that they're always hyper vigilant they're always trying to make sure that nothing threatening is happening in their environment what ends up happening is that you often see threatening things before they might have been as big a problem as you experienced. So I know that didn't make any sense. Let me try that again. I have learned most of my life that I need to act in particular ways in order to behave appropriately. And it was never that I was taught I have to act. I have to act in a particular way because, oh, sorry. The problem is that I was told that the way I wanted to act was wrong and I needed to act in this other way because that was the only good, right, or moral way to act. And when, when you're taught that type of information, well, you have to become hypervigilant. You have to make sure that you're never misacting in the wrong way. You also have to make sure from others in your environment if you might be acting in the wrong way. You're constantly looking, you're constantly checking to make sure how are others responding to me in this moment? And let's say somebody like, you know, squints their eyes. You don't necessarily know that that eye squinting thing is negative. But if your body interprets that it is, if your brain sort of sees it for a split second and starts making interpretations that maybe you've done something wrong, that starts off this cascade of behavioral changes or like neurochemical changes, all of these things that can cause basically a, a interaction that was going to go just fine to go way off the rails. So what's the difference? If we're not going to do this, what do we do instead? That's my son. He is uh, 17 years old. He also has autism and ADHD and a learning disability. So I think what we need to be teaching all of us, whether young, old, whoever, that we need to, sorry, we need to convey to individuals with autism that they are good enough as they are right now, not as they might someday be in the future. We do this by appreciating their effort and their opinions, because the more that we can believe in the person's strengths, the more that we can see the good in them as they are right now, the more that that individual will believe that they have value. If you are seeing the strengths in that individual and you share those strengths with that individual, that individual begins to see them too. The other thing that I think is really important is that we have to be more I wish more people would be okay with sitting with my really negative emotions because often, although my emotions are incredibly intense or incredibly overwhelming, what I really need is someone who's willing to just sit with me through them. I often know that my emotional reaction is out of proportion, quote unquote, to the objective live like the objective experience before me. But I also know that all of my trauma and all the previous prior learning means that I can't necessarily stop that emotional reaction. The information goes to your amygdala before it is processed by your frontal lobes. So in that moment, if you see something in your environment, you can't stop how your brain responds. You can't because you don't have any emotional control. So. What I really need is this. I need Winnie the Pooh. And I need Winnie the Pooh to say, all you need to do on those days when you feel when you feel not very okay at all is to come and find me and tell me. Don't ever feel like you have to hide the fact that you're not feeling that you're feeling not very okay at all. Always come and tell me because I will always be here.
I often don't need you to fix it. I often don't need you to tell me that my emotions are out of proportion to the event. I just need you to sit with me and help me get through it. Help me get through this intense negative emotion and just understand that, you know what, based on my neurology, based on my experiences, my reaction actually makes a great deal of sense. So I usually like to give little breaks in between the various sections just so that you can sort of think or process. So let me just take a few seconds and then I'll keep going. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now is something called sparks, flow, and special interests. So let's go back to that LAM study. So LAM et al. was looking at a large group of autistic individuals, and they actually used this really cool method called photo voice, where essentially they asked the participants to take photos. And so one of the themes that they found is that these autistic participants found well-being in expressing my unique self and showing personal growth. And so what does that really mean? Well, according to this study, a study there were sort of four main areas. So there was creative self-expression, hobbies and interests, learning to become a better self, and stepping out of one's comfort zone. So we're going to talk about the first two, creative self expression and hobbies and interests, and then we'll come back to the last two in a few slides. So um, there is this sort of newer theory in autism in the autism world. It's not brand new because it was first uh, talked about in 2005, but uh, it's gaining a lot of traction. It's being talked a lot about um, a lot more among autistic advocates. So let me explain what this theory is describing. So Basically, attention, what we know about, what we consider our attention or what we pay attention to. So we know that our attention can be fairly focused on a few interests or on a, on, it can be very focused on what we're doing in the moment, or it could be broadly distributed over many interests or even broadly distributed over many different inputs in your environment. So attention tends to be one of those two things. Sustained attention is something that we often talk about for little kids, and we often talk about how invaluable or important it is for children to have strong abilities to quote unquote sustain their attention. And so what a sustained attention technically is, is the capacity to maintain attention to a situation or a task, despite being distractible, tired, or bored. And so it's kind of funny that we talk about the importance of sustained attention when we're talking about schools and kids and kids learning to be effective learners. But why don't we say the same thing about autistics? Because autistics are often really, really good at this skill. And it's the fact that we're really good at this that sort of underlines, underlies this attention theory. So these researchers had, have described people with autism as, as having what they call a monotropic tendency. I have no idea where they got that word, and it's very hard to say. Regardless, that's what they decided to call it. What they say is that persons, any person, but a, particularly people with autism who tend to have this more often, they, we tend to have a we tend to have a few highly what they call aroused, or that just means passionate interests, but. What's really important about this sort of framing or understanding about how the attention of people with autism works is it really highlights that the interest model of autism is, shows that there are important advantages of this type of cognitive style. So for, oops, sorry. So for example, our tendency for intense concentration and focus may make it easier for us to enter Chi Segni Hai's what he called flow state. And as I've already alerted, alluded to earlier, this flow state often, or being in flow, often promotes a deep sense of well being for all of us. So, interests are basically what we care about, what we spontaneously and intrinsically give our attention to, and what we value, if only briefly. 
So in the Benson and Scales model, when we were talking about that earlier, it referred to thriving. In their model, they suggest that people who thrive tend to have a spark or maybe several sparks. And then they defined a spark as a passion for a self-identified interest, skill, or capacity that metaphorically lights a fire in a person's life by providing energy, joy, purpose, and direction. So being intensely focused or intensely passionate about a particular subject or activity is generally con considered one of the most defining characteristics of autism. And in fact, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, as many as 95% of autistic people have these intense or passionate interests. So in other words, we really need to think about how these special interests or intense interests of autistics should theoretically hold great promise for fostering our ability to experience well-being or to thrive, especially when you consider the fact that our time spent pursuing our intense interests or special interests can be that can amount to that of a part-time job. I really love this quote. And obviously it was by Winter Messiers in 2007, if you're um, familiar with this literature, but she basically said, to truly know a person with autism, you must know our special interest areas. It is not enough to just acknowledge that intense special interests are important to us. We define ourselves by our passionate interests. And after our family, our interests are often the most important things in our lives. It's often, it's also really important to point out at this juncture that society loves to pathologize the special interests of people with autism. Because seriously, if a little boy had an intense special interest in the Edmonton Oilers, no one is going to bat an eye. He could collect as many cards and posters and whatever he wants, and that's going to be considered quote unquote typical behavior, or at least not outside the realm of normal. But for people with autism, because people, others don't quite understand our interests or don't believe that our interests should hold the value that they do, they love to suggest that our behavior is somehow atypical. So let me give you a good example of this, as embarrassing it is from my own life. So when I was in high school and in undergrad, my intense, passionate interest was General Hospital. So. It was the 90s, so I used to use a VCR to record General Hospital every single day when I was at school, and then I'd watch it when I got home. I collected pictures of my favorite characters, like Brenda and Sunny shown here, and I would paste all of those pictures into scrapbooks, and I would put posters up all over the, my wall. It was much, um, soap opera mags were a big thing back then, and I would collect the magazines, and I would cut out the pictures. In fact, if Brenda, the, the woman on the slide, if Brenda ever wore an outfit that I particularly admired, I had my mother-in-law at the time, who happened to be a seamstress, recreate the outfit for me. So I had three or four different outfits at that time that Brenda had worn on the show that I had my mother-in-law make for me. In fact, I even traveled, as embarrassing as it is, to Walt Disney World in Florida one summer so that I could attend the ABC Super Soap Weekend. And I waited in line, despite my sensory issues, I waited in line for hours to get Brenda's photograph. But as you might imagine, my mother hated my obsession with General Hospital. We had endless fights about it. To be fair, often it was because I would refuse to miss any single episode. But nothing my mother said or did ever impacted the intensity of my obsession. However, today, I don't have that obsession. Today, I have many different ones. <laughs> my interest in GH eventually did wane, despite the fact that it held me in its grip for almost a decade. But it did fade naturally on all, all on its own. Many years later, a psychologist explained to me that I had probably used General Hospital to learn about how people felt and interacted and, and acted in the quote-unquote non-autistic world. 
um, in a soap opera, the plots move very slowly and all of the emotions are really exaggerated. And so General Hospital sort of became the perfect training ground for me to understand how non-autistic brains perceived, understood, and interpreted the world. The other thing is that I was really struggling socially. And one thing that so, uh, soap operas are excellent at doing is they become your friends. They become, and not a necessarily a good substitute, I'm not suggesting that it is, but at that time, it was better than nothing. At that time, they were my friends. They were the people I cared about. They were the people I worried about. They were the people that I was wanting to make see what happened next. And I know I'm not suggesting that that is necessarily the healthiest thing, but it was better than not having any friends at all. So the key point in all of this is that while my mother couldn't see any value in my obsession, obsession with General Hospital, one of the reasons that my interest was so intense is because it, I was learning and it was meaningful to me. So what we know is that an integral part of experiencing well-being for autistic adults includes having opportunities for us to engage in personal interests and hobbies that give us some sense of enjoyment and fulfillment. So here's an example um, from that particular study, the photo boy study, where they were basically asked to take photos of things that um, sort of showed their well-being. So John is an autistic adult who had graduated high school and he was reflecting on his experience of working at a train yard for one of his co-ops or intern internships. And so this is what he said. So he completed an internship at a rail company where he had enjoyed watching and hearing the freight train. And basically he wrote, it's something that I love. It also makes this sound that I love to hear. Railroads would be the one thing that represents my well-being. I would improve my well-being by traveling across the country by train. So this individual was essentially weaving their special interest into their life so that they could experience more well-being. They're not suggesting that the only thing to do in their world is to sit and listen to trains, but they're but knowing that that is an interest or a love or a passion of theirs, they're weaving it into things like high school co-ops or weaving it into things like vacations. And so they know that by weaving in those special interests, overall, they experience more well-being. Another individual in a different study, he described that I have always been happiest when absorbed in a very detailed problem solving. And so that was really interesting, too, because he's basically saying that. Uh, so what I sorry, I got myself in a tangle there. Let me start that again. What I found most interesting about this is how, again, it's not necessarily tied to a job, but the fact that that he enjoys or he's happiest when he's absorbed in this sort of detailed problem solving gives him a clue of what kind of a job might make him happiest. And that's certainly what I did in my own world. Once I found out that I had autism, so in other words, I was an elementary school teacher and I had a little boy in my class, a grade two class, who I was told had autism. And so then by working with this little boy, I started to think and wonder and, and I was curious about whether my grade two self would have looked and acted much like he did in, of course, my female form. And so the more I learned about autism, the more it started to make sense. And I started then exploring it with both my therapist and reading books and so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. Now, let me skip ahead. I now know that I have autism and I've got the diagnosis. Well, then I started to say to myself, okay, well, if I have autism, if this is the way that I work, what career might be best for my brain? And what I was noticing at the time was that as much as I love working in the classroom, the constant being on all the time and managing these 30 humans all the time with my sensory sensitivities, it was pretty much, it was a lot. It was a lot for me. I loved working with the kids. I still do. I love being with them. But I started to wonder if, well, maybe my autistic brain would be happier working in grad school and working with research and trying to understand education or autism in a more systematic way. And for me, that actually worked really well. But the way that I got there was sort of trying to understand what my autistic brain liked to do and then trying to do more of it. 
So what we know is that intense or passionate interests come with a lot of advantages. So often if we're talking about kids, um, especially if they're in high school, we know that you uh, that like I sort of alluded to, using or integrating intense or passionate interests into the, what they're learning gives them improved access for learning curriculum and improves their outcomes on tests. We know that there's more task completion. We know that it improves our, their communication. In other words, if you ask someone to talk about their intense or passionate interests, they're might much more likely to try to communicate that information. And by the fact that they're working hard to communicate, it's going to improve if in the moment or over time, your overall communication. Uh, special interests lead to often lead to more friends, especially if you can weave that special interest into a peer group. I know that's not always possible, but when we can, it can work really well. It can often lead to greater independence. So for me, for example, I want to do my prof job. I do. I want to do it. And so, but it's hard for me. Like, it's not easy. But the fact that I want to do it, that I'm motivated to do it, means that I'm going to try really hard to do some of those things that I find really difficult. And the more that I try to do those things that I find really difficult, the better I get at them. And then they're a little bit less difficult. And so that's what we mean when they say that special interests can lead to more independence. Of course, it's going to lead to subjective well-being in the moment. You're going to feel more happy in the moment when you're engaging in these interests. It's often a source of comfort. And it's often an area of expertise. In other words, our interests often lead to expertise. And one of the things that is most interesting from the field of positive psychology is the idea that happiness precedes success and not the other way around. So if you look at the most successful people in their careers, those individuals didn't get there by being miserable. They got there because they loved the area that they were working in and they wanted to learn more and do more. And so that you can't be miserable every single day of your life and become necessarily an expert in what you're miserable at. That's just going to lead to mental health problems. That's just going to lead to burnout. And that happened. That is true for everyone. That's true whether you're autistic or not. But what's really cool is that it's when we have these passionate interests, when we are intrinsically motivated to learn or understand a discipline, that's what leads to expertise. So positive emotions always precede success and not the other way around, which I think is really important. And I've tried to remember all the time for my own self. So in sum, Passionate or intense interests serve, often serve as our artistic way, often serve us as autistics as our way to make sense of the world. They often give us clear focus, a way to organize our world, and a way to interpret life. And given that young people with sparks, we know that all young people with sparks appear to have richer, more meaningful lives. The autistic tendency to develop these sort of passionate interests should be nurtured as the strengths that they are, rather than suppressed as symptoms of clinical impairment. Equally important to punish someone by removing our special interest is, in essence, to strip us of a large source of comfort, soothing, and strength. A best practice is going to be to merge our special interests or our passionate interests with whatever we are learning at school or work. And in fact, this merging of our interests may be the, one of the only ways for us to ever be able to demonstrate our true levels of ability. So I have reached the next sort of break. Um, I'm gonna just take a minute or so just to think, and uh, I will start in just a couple seconds. <clears throat> okay, so remember I said I would come back to the bottom two about learning to become a better self and stepping out of one's comfort zone? 
So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to talk about how these two aspects can be critical to our uh, to our ability to experience wellness or for our ability of autistics to thrive. Now, one thing that's really, really, really important is that autonomy and self-determination are critical to this sort of pillar of wellness. And so what do I mean in case you're not sure of what I'm talking about if I say self-determination? Because obviously that's a very complicated word that psychologists like to make up. So what does it mean? Well, uh, this type, the self-determination theory, it, what it says is that all humans have an inherent tendency to move towards growth and that we all, everyone has three, have three core psychological needs. So the first one is competence or your ability to feel mastery. The second one is autonomy, which is the ability to make your own choices. And it refers to the degree to which a person acts in according to their preferences, interests, and abilities. And then the last one is relatedness or the feeling of belonging and connection. And so this is the third uh, model of well-being that I said I was going to cover tonight. And you can see how it overlaps with all the others. But what I really want to focus on here is this idea of competence and of autonomy. <clears throat> so remember I was saying a little bit before about how I had uh, once I learned I had autism, I decided to figure out how I could use my autistic traits to my best advantage, which is what sent me back to grad school. And so that would be my first recommendation that in order to thrive, we have to take our, our neurology that was gifted to us and figure out a way to use it and make it work. And so my, my son came home from school one day and he had made this beautiful art project for me, this beautiful painting. And he had, had um, written this quote on it. And so of course I had no idea what it was. I hadn't really heard of it before as maybe I should, but I hadn't. But it, it seems to have been very important because basically what it says is the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. So, <clears throat> What one of the things that from so let's go back to that study about the successful autistic women. And so it was interesting when I read the, that article, they were talking about how several of the participants. So these are successful autistic women spoke about encountering early failures, such as dropping out of school or experiencing problematic relationships. And although they all had these really, um, say, failures in earlier in life. They were also able to identify inner qualities, which enabled them to persist despite the difficulty and ultimately succeed in some way. So an example of this would be when they later said that their ability to focus on a goal was one of the things that they felt helped them the most when they encountered problems. So often the we have to remember that the fact that we're experiencing problems isn't necessarily the test of whether or not we will ultimately go on to be successful. Rather, what we really need to figure out is even though I'm experiencing problems, what skills or attributes or traits can I use here to help me get out of this mess? <laughs> Certainly that was true in my life. I mean, I actually, um, quit undergrad after third year the first time. So I did go back and finish my fourth year, but originally I stopped undergrad in my third year. I couldn't handle the stress. I was so focused on getting high grades because that was really the only thing I could do very well back then. I could, I learned how to learn. I learned how to do really well in school, but that was basically all I could do. I didn't have really a friends. I struggled at school. I struggled to find job or to maintain my employment, blah, blah, blah. And so when you University was so much harder and I became even more and more focused on creating this sort of perfectionist academic whatever it just became so unmanageable that I ended up quitting I ended up finishing my third year and taking a general BA because I really didn't think I could do much more and yet here I am 25 years later a professor with multiple multiple degrees and no one could have guessed that not back then you would never have known that but instead, what we really need to think about is, okay, well, she's struggling right now, but that doesn't mean that she's going to struggle forever. And that doesn't mean that she can't learn the things that she's struggling with. It just means that right now she needs more support. And let's figure out how we can get her that support so that she can keep moving forward.
This is a study that was published in 2021, so very recently. And basically they were working with a group of autistics to try and figure out, well, what types of skills do uh, uh, many autistic people have in, in their employment? So they were really focused on what types of autistic traits often service well in an employment setting. And so these are some of the traits that they pointed out. They talked about our superior memory, our superior pattern recognition, our sustained and intense focus, our attention to detail, our logical and systematic minds, our love of repetition, the fact that we can be creative and innovative, the fact that we're often very honest and very trustworthy, and the fact that we love detail means that we're often very meticulous and very conscientious. And all of those serve us very well in, in an employment and in our lives more generally. So we actually, in one of the studies with the Center for Autism Services here in Edmonton, we were working with a small group of autistic women, adult autistic women, and um, some uh, one participant who is gender non-binary. And basically, we were asking them to describe their spark. I wanted to hear from them what they felt their spark was. One of the things that these individuals reported or described to us was their love of learning. This is a very common trait that we hear in people with autism. In fact, we often use that to diagnose autism. So I remember there's this woman named Dr. Aubin Stainer. She's a very prominent researcher at the University UC Davis Mind Institute. And she was relating the story about how parents will often come to her and say, oh, my child's two and they've already learned to do X, Y, Z and blah, blah, blah. And they're so advanced and so skilled. And I remember Aubin at that moment was trying to sort of, she actually felt bad because she felt bad in that moment because she had to tell the mother or the father that that's actually a symptom of autism. The fact that the child is showing these progressive skills at such a young age in a particular area. The point is that why are we, why are we looking that at that as only a clinical marker? Why are we only seeing that for the negative? Why don't we see that many, many people with autism love to learn and that they're really good at it when it's in their area of interest? So in this particular study, these are some of the interests or some of the love of learning that they had uh, mentioned to me. And so I'm just sort of leaving it there so you can get an idea of what some of them said. So why, how does this sort of all tie together? So what's really interesting is that in the field of education, we often talk about the importance of deliberate practice. So deliberate practice is characterized by a high degree of focused effort to develop specific skills and concepts that are beyond one's current ability. And deliberate practice is not just repeated performance, it's effortful practice that push learners beyond their current level of performance. So for example, if you're playing basketball games is not the way that you're actually going to get better at playing basketball. If you're just going to play games, if that's the only place that you're ever going to practice, then it leads to something called a performance plateau. To escape this plateau, players actually need to step away from the game so their very reason for playing basketball and dedicate efforts to improving specific shots, moves, and general function. So this is something that we would say to teachers and children and parents that this is something that we want kids to do. What, sorry, I didn't say the one part that I wanted to say about the slide, which is this is something that people with autism are really good at doing. We love deliberate practice. We love practicing our skills. We often love repetition. And so I'm not saying that we all do. So sorry, I shouldn't have been but often we do. And if that is a skill that you have, if that is a trait or a strength that you have, we need to start recognizing that strength. Now, what's really important about this is when we think about the development of expertise. So way back in 1993, so Erickson, who's a very famous developmental psychologist and a couple other researchers, they were looking at violin students at a prestigious Berlin School of Music. So some of the students are preparing to become music teachers and other students were preparing to become concert violinists. So the people who wanted to become concert violinists, I uh, can't even say the word, who wanted, to, <laughs> who wanted to do this as their profession, they wanted to be a professional violinist, those individuals practiced alone and not for fun about 24 hours a week. Whereas the people who wanted to become music teachers, they only practice their instruments for about nine hours a week. So you can imagine that 
how many over the years, how these differences can accumulate into thousands of hours of practice. And really that is what underlies the development of expertise. And where we get more evidence of this is from some really cool uh, research experiments. So first they were looking at grand chess masters and they were looking at abacus masters. And these are people who are really, really amazing at both abacus or, and at, so abacus you're mentally calculating or something, it has something to do with mental calculation, please forgive me. But they who have this sort of, oh, here it is, I've got it written down. So they hear a number every 2.5 seconds and then they can compute the following in number or the total in their heads in real time without an abacus. So in other words, they're really, really good at being given these numbers and mentally adding them up and keep going. Grand chess masters are really, really good at memorizing where the chess pieces are on the board. But what was really, really cool about these studies is that when we test, say, the visual spatial skills of grand chess masters. So I just said that these chess masters can memorize the positions of their um, little men on the board. Well, when you look at their visual spatial skills, which is the underlying skill of that sort of memory system, um, their visual spatial skills are no better. And, in, and the same with the abacus masters. If you ask them to just memorize just a list of random words, their memories are no better. It's that it's only it, what they're, what they, they become so expert at recognizing the patterns at doing a particular task. So like, for example, with the chess pieces, if you just put those chess pieces on the board randomly, they won't be able to remember them either. The reason they can remember them within a chess game is because there's only certain patterns that those chess pieces are ever in and they practice and become so expert in it that they have access to all of that information. And I just think that is so cool. And, and the other thing about this, the reason I've got the cab on there, this is a really, they had, so neuroscientists, these are newer researchers, but anyway, the neuroscientists, they got really excited about black cab black cabbies in London. So if you don't aren't aware, London, like the city of London in England, it is incredibly confusing system of roads. They don't follow any kind of logical pattern and roads end. And anyway, so these black cabbie drivers, they have to memorize all of the locations and patterns. They have to learn to navigate England by knowing about, um, basically be like trying to navigate your way through a forest without signs. And you have to basically choose choose different landmarks and recognize certain trees and they have to do the same thing. They can't necessarily rely on north, south, east, west or, you know, their grid or whatever. They literally need to memorize and have all of this complex information. So why am I telling all this? Well, when we look at the brains of these black cabbie drivers in an MRI machine, so you can actually see where everything lights up, they have a much larger hippocampus, which we know is involved in spatial recognition. Now, let's compare them to the bus drivers in, in London, England, because those bus drivers, they have to navigate the same streets, they have to have that same understanding of how London works, but they don't have to memorize anything. The black cabbies, they have to take this like intense test that tests their knowledge, the declarative knowledge of everything they memorize, whereas the bus drivers don't. The point is, is that the bus drivers don't show this hippocampal expansion. So the fact that they haven't become experts, their brain hasn't actually changed in response to that knowledge. Even more importantly, when these black cabbies stop working and you look at their brains later, so they're no longer driving their cabs, their hippocampus, their spatial memory, it shrinks. So why is this so cool? Well, it's so cool because it talks Okay, so it talks about how the brain is plastic. It talks about how learning can change our abilities and our skills. And it talks about how important practice is to becoming experts. And given that so many of us with autism are really happy to spend a great deal of time on any kind of passionate meaning or meaningful interest, it certainly gives us a lot of clues about how you might best support yourself and your future uh, happiness. So, I'm going to just click here because there's a few, I know there's a bunch of slides, but I also know that I was only supposed to talk for an hour and I don't want to take too much longer. So I'm just going to sort of skip a few and I'm just going to give you a couple of key thoughts that I want you to take away with. 
So the first is this, I asked the participants in the study that I referred to earlier about sparks. I asked them what gets in the way of your spark? What, what threatens your ability? What threatens your ability to engage with your passionate or intense interests? And so a lot of what these ladies talked about was this idea of ableism or societal norms or society shoulds. It's everyone telling us that we have to act in a certain way um, and how important it is for us to act like everybody else. And so that type of thinking or that type of messaging is often very harmful to our ability to thrive. The other one that's often really important is this, this idea of susceptibility to stress. I mean, that's certainly true in my case. My hyperreactive nervous system means that I'm always going to be the first person who's going to react to any kind of threat, whether uh, it's reasonable or not. And so this hyperreactivity that I experience often means that I'm going to be one of the first people that's going to find dealing with intense stress really difficult. But however, even though that that is true, I still want you to focus on the fact of this idea of what's called positive niche construction, which I know is another stupid term, but regardless, the fact is, is what this is referring to is this idea about how many species, and we often said in our world, like in our understanding of science, we often talk about survival of the fittest and that whatever, you know, organism is most well adapted will be the one that thrives. But that's not actually what we see. There are a lot of examples where what actually happens is that the animals that thrive are the animals that are able to act directly on their environment and create an environment for themselves within which they can thrive. So you see that when a beaver builds a dam or a, or a bird builds a nest, we're building an environment to support ourselves. And so in that same way, we can, with autism, build these types of environments for ourselves so that we can show our true ability and our potential. It's also really important that people around us nourish our spark, that we have our coworkers or our animals or friends or family, or even just if it's ourself, but we have to feel this. We, it's really important that we have people that support us in these. And then this is the very last thing that I'm gonna say. One of the things I started with talking about was this idea of well-being and about how well-being is often more than simply the absence of negative things. So it's more than simply not being depressed or anxious. And because that is true, often the strategy that we need to move forward is very different. We Instead of thinking about what do I do to become less anxious? What do I do to become less depressed? We need to start thinking that when it's time for change, for whatever reason, we have to look for the bright spots, bright spots. We have to look for the first signs that things are working. And then once we start noticing what is working, we need to ask ourselves a very simple but very unnatural question. Well, what is working? And then how can I do more of what's working? How can I find those times in my day where things are going well and make those times happen more often? Because that's often the pathway forward. It's not looking at depression. It's not looking at anxiety. It's looking at what's going well for me and how can I do more of those things. So that's my very last thought. I thank you all for your attention. I know we're going to have a bit of discussion for anyone who would like. But again, I thank all of you for attending tonight and listening to me speak. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, that was fantastic. Um, I, I'm just I'm sitting here and my head is spinning. Um, I, I think your your the presentation was inspirational, not just for autistics, but for everyone. Um, and you know, to the to the group here, the attendees, um, I, I, I I'm rarely speechless. Um, but what what I I'm speechless about is that Heather's woven together about a dozen different theories, philosophies, and approaches into this masterful brilliant and amazing way made sense of a whole bunch of different domains of research and literature and brought it together into this one coherent package that um yeah i don't see that happen very often and i i'm i need time to process this to be honest with you. <laughs> I, don't, I, I i need an hour or two to sit with this and then have the discussion but we would be we'd be way too late um yeah i, I think i want to take a class from you is, is i think what i want to do um <laughs> 
if you don't mind me stalking one of your uh, one of your classes. Um, I'm sure for those... I can learn as much from you, so we'll have to share resources. Okay. okay that that is nice of you to say. I, I'm flattered. Um, for anyone anyone who is um, you know, if you need some time to process and think about everything that you've heard and really, you know, digest some of those bits, please do take the time. I have a few different uh, kind of reflections I want to share, get Heather's opinion and, and feedback on a couple of things. Please do, though, if you have questions or any comments, write them down in the chat. Um, you fire them into the chat. I'm going to monitor the chat as Heather is, is responding to some of the, the questions or the, the conversation, um, and then I'll get to them and, and you can either send them to everyone. So as you go into the chat, you can assign it so that everyone will see what you wrote, or you can um, just select you want to send it to the presenter only or the panelists. I'm considered one of the panelists. Um, you can send it to whomever. And, uh, and yeah, so you can either send it out so everyone can see it or send it to us individually. Either way, we'll get to your questions um, and you know, hopefully have a chance to answer um, whatever, whatever burning thoughts or questions you might have. Um, and truly, uh, you know, for, for those folks who um, I'm thinking about, you know, CES, Laura, who's uh, on the line, Kate, another city staff member who's on the line, they know I'm never like stuck for words very often. This is, um, this doesn't happen. So I need a minute to kind of collect myself here. Um, there's a handful of things that you said that really do stand out to me. Um, so I think that there's a couple of, of reflections and then a few kind of questions. Um, I want to start out with a uh, maybe just a comment, I guess, um, and, and I, of course, I welcome you to weigh in on that as well. Um, I'm a big fan of the, uh, you know, the positive psychology. Some of our training and research um, has, has actually lines up quite nicely. We research some of the same things, um, but the flow state stuff um, that is. I love that stuff. Um, one of the things I wanted to acknowledge is, you know, over the years that I've been working in the field, um, I've experienced it myself, supporting individuals on the spectrum, but in particular, I've had parents mention this to me, working with little ones countless times. And they talk about this notion that um, their kids will be so hyper-focused, right, in that flow state, as you described it, where they're not sure, is the child ignoring them when they're calling them for dinner or calling their name and, you know, the kid's not responding? Um, you know, what's going on there? And, and I do want to acknowledge that in that flow state, what research has found and, and what I think, you know, understanding the flow state, what I ask, what I'll invite the audience here to think about when you are interacting with somebody who you think is in the flow state, be aware in that moment, time slows down. For the person who's engaged in that flow state, time slows down to a dead stop. Our ability to monitor time, to monitor our other senses, almost disappears. Um, in practice, it means that long periods of time can go by that seem like an instant. You sit down at the computer and, and I'm like this. I, one of my sparks is mountain biking or motorcycling. I'll sit down and start YouTubing different how-to clips, how to <laughs> fix this part or change that. And like four hours will go by. Um, and I don't know how that happens. But why I wanna share that is um, you know, parents often wonder, well, you know, are you just ignoring me? And then they start getting mad at their child when in fact, it might be the case that the child just didn't hear you. They're not processing all of their, their brain is focused on what they are consuming through their eyes or through their fingers. So it's almost as though the, the, the hearing has shut off. They're not, they're actually not hearing. And so if you walk up and you get in their space, I, I guarantee you there's people in, in this room here who have experienced that where it's like you scare the person, you startle you them back into the world, the right? Um, because they're so, focused. they're so focused. And I think it's just, it's an important reflection that that flow state is something that's very well, like well understood, it's, it's, it's well researched. And it's something that I think is a really, um, it's important to consider when you're interacting with your little ones or anyone for that matter, um, they're not being rude, they're not ignoring you, they're not ignoring their chores. They're really just hyper-focused on this thing. And we all do that. We all have examples of that in our lives. Um, it's a human thing. Um, so yeah, I'm saying that because you know, the psychologist in me wants to say, cut your kids some slack. Um, you know, that, that, that's basically it. So yeah, that, that's, I guess, my first comment. I don't know if you, you want to- You know what's funny about what you just said? 
um, is I can tell what happens. So my parents have uh, come to visit me. And so they are often, uh, they, so I've got my perfect environment that I have all my sensory needs met, but my parents right now are visiting me. And so they make noises that I don't usually have in my environment, like the creaking of the chair, right? So that one has been bugging me a lot that the chair keeps creaking. And so what I notice is that I can almost tell when I'm in flow and when I'm not, because if I can hear the chair and it's driving me nuts, I'm not in flow. But then there'll be other times where, I'm, like this presentation, I've been so focused on finishing this presentation that I won't have any awareness that they're even in the room. Like, it's so weird that how can I be so hypersensitive to noise in some examples and so completely deaf to everything going around us? Like, it's quite an interesting phenomenon but it's still absolutely. real like i'm not making it up <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely um another comment slash question um is you know I, I really like the point about the unconditional acceptance um and that came up a couple of times just that notion like i think you'd mentioned about you know you get unconditional acceptance from animals you get that from people right it's really thinking about it in a broader sense um everyone wants that Everyone desires it. Um, I want to make a point, uh, make the point, and there, there's a couple of points there, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, parents love their kids unconditionally. Um, absolutely, right? It's that, that unconditional positive regard, unconditional acceptance, absolutely. Um, however, parents also want the best for their kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, parents have more experience in this world, they know how things work, and they want to guide their kids in a direction that they think um, is going to make the kid's life easier. They, they like, again, it's coming from the right place. It is. You're doing what a parent is supposed to do. Um, what I think it's important, like, and again, it's, it's trying to, you know, weave the thread through some of the ideas that you shared, but that, you know, I want to, I want to consider that, you know, the relationship is not one way. Um, that relationship for steering for for trying to support your kids, like any relationship, it's a two-way street. You know, you want your kids to, to, I'll say, bend to some of your preferences, the way you think they should behave, for lack of a better term, some of the ways or you want them. they'll be healthy, what, yes. what negative things they need to take on that they're not Absolutely. enjoying now that will ultimately benefit them. Yeah, that's right. You know, it, it's like, you know, whether it's, you know, work now, play later, whatever, right? It's the idea, yeah. these are the kinds of things you should be doing as opposed to whatever you're doing now. And I'm thinking, you know, video games, for me, it was being outside on my bike. Um, anyway, you know, I think it's important that parents also bend to the desires of your, their child, meeting the child where they're at. And I think that all your conversation about the spark really, really does um, fit well with this idea that I've had about it. So I wanted to get your two cents on this. The, the idea, we want parents to be able to recognize that spark in their child and not just acknowledge it and say, yes, my child likes bikes. My child likes general hospital. My child likes video games. But to go that one step further, and I think this is part of that thinking about some of the other theories and concepts you, you shared, you know, thinking that, you know, if your child really, really likes that thing, that is an opportunity for not just you to let them have it, but that's an opportunity for the connection. You can, if you show interest as a parent in your child's spark, in your child's interest, whether you get it or not, right? This notion of trying to understand and appreciate what they value is important. One of the things that we know and, and is related to your talk is that notion that we all need to have that those sense of accomplishments right some of that self-determination theory stuff we need to have those feelings of competence and that makes us you know it contributes to feeling more self-determined and, and more wellness but when we talk about that relatedness the bond the connection the unconditional positive regard you know i really want parents to consider you know get to know what your child's spark is you know participate in the spark with them, understand it, celebrate their successes within the spark. When you do have an accomplishment, something that you know you personally value, that's great. But if the other people around you that you care about also value and show, like show value in that thing and, and they support you in that and they appreciate your success in that domain, that's that much more powerful. 
it, it's going to contribute to wellness that much more ultimately. And so to take the time to really acknowledge your child's spark, understand their accomplishments, celebrate those accomplishments along with your child, you're strengthening your connection, helping to support positive relationships, accomplishment, getting closer to that concept of flourishing and wellness. Um, you know, I think a bunch of those things that you said, you could bring them all together and they could, you could marry all of those things within a couple of activities or a couple of interactions and everyone is set up for success. Um, I, I, I really like the way that you did that and the way you talked about it. And so, yeah, my, one of the takeaways for me was really wanting to, you know, hit that point again, that, you know, parents, if you take the time to really appreciate your child's passions, get in there with them, that can really help to strengthen all of the things that lead to wellness. Um, but you know, uh, the one thing I want to add to what you're saying is the idea of strength based learning strategies, right? So, for example, we have to stop like if your kid hates writing at school, you cannot just force your kid to write every single day. Like they're not necessarily going to get any better at it and they're just going to be miserable all the time. But if you could get them to write about their special interests, well, now if there's some, like if you're intrinsically motivated to do, because you want to achieve a particular goal and you're intrinsically motivated to to achieve that goal, you're more willing to do things that are hard or challenging. So in order, if you really want to support a child, like for example, Aiden, when he was really little, when I had very few successes with Aiden, Aiden hated school beyond any um, imagining, but one of the few successes that I had with him is when I, he was intensely obsessed with Minecraft. He was in a grade three or grade four. He was intensely in, um, obsessed with it. And what I managed to make him do was create an entire um, presentation because it was an after school project. So create an entire presentation, which was a research study in Minecraft about blowing up different forms of rock. And then we tested how the different strengths between these different materials and how fast and whatever he could blow them up. Like, I know that's completely ridiculous, but I took his special interest. I made him do a science project and he completed it. And so that's what we mean. We have to often use the special interests in order to get the to get ourselves or the people that we love and support to do the things that we need to do. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic example. Fantastic example. We've got a few questions that are starting to populate the chat, but I do I want to I wanted to acknowledge one other thing first. And um, you know, you talked about the um, this notion of being kind of hyper aware, the hyper vigilance. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I want to comment on is, um, uh, again, you've weaved together so many things. <laughs> I, I need some time to to pull it all together in, in a way that doesn't make me sound like I don't, you know, I'm, I'm an idiot over here. Um, You're completely incompetent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm feeling that. You're making me feel incompetent. I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, you know, one of the things that we know about just the human condition is that when we are feeling threatened, so if we're in that hyper aware state, if we are constantly, you know, being hyper vigilant about all of the things that happen around us, um, regardless of what the stressor is, that constant bombardment of stress ho hormones wears down our ability to cope. It increases the risk of development of both mental health problems as well as physical health problems, right? Yes. We know, and I mean, you, you shared this, and, and I hope everyone heard it loud and clear that, you know, Autism is not a problem. It's all the co-occurring conditions that are getting in the way of success. And that's, a, that's a, such a big thing. The brain, when it is experiencing that stress, it doesn't matter whether or not it's, it's fear of, of you know, something happening in uncontrollable thing in a classroom, or it, I mean, this sounds like a, a, a fictitious example, but bear with me, or somebody who's having to live in a war zone. The context does not matter. The brain doesn't process the, the hormones in the brain. The cortisol does not process a difference in, oh, well, what, you know, is this about, you know, I'm not going to get a chance. Physical safety. If I can pick on your example, I'm not going to get a chance to watch general hospital, or I'm worried about what my classmates are going to say in this group project, or if I'm under physical threat, the brain doesn't make a difference. There's no discrimination. It's just stress. And we know that that constant stress eats away at our ability to function. And that is super, super critical. That leads to trauma. And like 
point made that leads to trauma. And we know that trauma changes how our brain processes information. And you shared with us your personal example of that, you know, your emotional reactions may look like they do not fit the context to other people. Yes. But given yes. your history, they make a world of sense because of yes. the way your brain processes that information. You yes. know, whether we would call it right or wrong is irrelevant. That has no it bearing is, on it. It's, it's this biology. Is the way that it's the, the way your biology has learned to react to your environment. Yes. And, and I can't stop it. It's so frustrating. There you go. That's what I wanted to get to, right? You cannot stop that. So, you know, for parents out there, for professionals who are listening in, it's really important to understand that, that the brain and biology, this is not, this is not to be interpreted as inappropriate behavior, bad behavior, challenging behavior. This is a biological response that has, it has evolved to that place because of that repeated kind of small T trauma, right? Yeah. Um, critical critical just to note that you know this is not an autism thing it's a human being thing and we just need to be sensitive to that we need to understand that so that we are when we're trying to interpret people's behavior if i'm a supporter and i want to support someone on the spectrum that i can't tell them just to behave differently i can't tell them to get over it i can't tell them to not think about it that way this is part of the biology of the person that i'm with um yes. and i think that for me that frame of mind or understanding it that way helps me to be a better supporter, helps me just to, to, you know, helps me to, I think, not just be more patient, but be more empathetic and to realize that, um, you know, we all have, like, as a human species, we're fragile. Um, and we need to, uh, you know, I said it before, but, you know, cut ourselves slack. Um, I think, though, that it's really also really important to understand. So I agree with everything you said, but I just want to take it one step further. Even though that this is true, that I have this hyperreactive nervous system, and I have all of this trauma that has occurred in my life, which means I'm even more hyperreactive than I might have been. Even though all of that's true, the brain is plastic. I can mm -hmm. do things to change it. And so what I've had to learn to do, what I wish someone had told my parents when I was five instead of learning it when I'm 40, but is meditation. It's mindfulness. Mindfulness and meditation, all it is, is learning how to dysregulate, learning how to regulate yourself down. I mean, learning how to become less stimulated, which is the mm -hmm. chronic state I'm always in. I'm always overstimulated. And so in... So even though everything that Shane has said is true, even though it will never ever be particularly easy for me, I can make it better by learning strategies to help myself not be always in this hyper stress state. And thank you for that clarity. So it's not that it is a fait accompli, like it's, it's done, but the important part is that it's not going to change on its own without without doing something differently, right? You've got to work on it. And it is, it's work. You've, you've got it's to learn some strategies. Not um, it's not just gonna happen on its own. You can't will it away. No. That's the, that's the point. Um, all right, let's dip into some of the questions in the chat here. Um, first question I see is any advice on how to maybe integrate special interests into other things? So yeah. I think you gave an example of the mind craft, um, right. but it, would there be any kind of strategies that you would offer that of just for people to consider how to think about incorporating special interests into daily life, other activities. So I guess um, I would look at what are the underlying skills or, or interests in the activity. So let's say for an example, because I'm teaching a, a I'm teaching introduction to supporting students who are neurodivergent. So I'm teaching that introductory course right now to a bunch of high school teachers. And they ask me this, like, I'm teaching biology. How am I supposed to possibly integrate the student's special interest with the biology courses that I'm teaching? And so I said, well, you're going to have to be maybe a bit imaginative. And so, so I said, if a high school student is in biology, hopefully there's something in that course that's interesting to them. Hopefully there's something about that course that interests them in some way. So let's say he said there was one unit on amphibians. So let's say that your special interest or intense interest had to do with amphibians. Maybe for the rest of the 
maybe for the entire term, you're going to have to relate everything to that interest. So now I'm studying bears. How do the, what are the differences? Can you compare and contrast the differences between amphibians and bears? Or can you, can you, can you bring that special interest in some way to weave it into everything else that you're doing? You could do the same thing with the skill, like that example of the, the man who really liked listening to trains. So he does an internship in a rail yard. He's learning real job skills, but he's getting some intrinsic enjoyment out of being in that environment or me loving to look at numbers and patterns so going to grad school because i love numbers and patterns makes a lot of sense because that's primarily what i'm asked to do so those would be four sort of examples off the top of my head <laughs> thank you very much um next question here that came in is um uh when a child is sensitive and listens to his teachers very well but the parents um are saying that you know, he's not listening or behaving, sometimes rude to them. Uh, is this a sign of some kind of learned behavior um, or is it something else? Um, the question, uh, sort of the follow-up question here is, you know, how do you recognize a child with autism symptoms um, or what is sort of common symptoms to identify an autistic child? Um, I mean, I think that, that it's a huge question because there's lots of things that are used as part of the diagnostic process. Um, but I would say, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to interpret anymore. I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that for you. Um, what, what would you say are like signs that a child may have autism that, uh, you know, maybe an educator, uh, like the example that you shared before, um, you know, you as a teacher, right, seeing a young child, what are some things that you might see that you would say, okay, well, this is, this is maybe something that you know, I should talk to the parent about, or maybe this might be a sign of autism. Okay, so the first thing I think that's really important is the intentionality behind the behavior, right? So a person who is being intentionally rude is usually feeling pretty angry and defiant. So if that's what's going on, then you have a clue that we're not sure why the child's angry or defiant, but that sort of gives us a clue or a pathway to explore. Whereas if it's if the intention behind the behavior is to focus intensely on an interest, for example, a very common trait of autism, then you have a much different explanation. I think what you really need to figure out is what is the child getting from the behavior, right? And, and then once you figure out what the child needs, right, because every behavior is really a need. It's just sharing information. I know that the behavior may not be pleasant or enjoyable, but at its very basic form, it's simply sharing information. And so we need to figure out what is that child sharing? What need are they trying to communicate? And then once we sort of figure out what the need is, then we can figure out why they have that need. And if it might be a hyperreactive nervous system, or it might be trauma, or it might be what have you, but there's a reason. And then we go looking for it. Absolutely agreed. Um, you know, there's, there's a reason for every behavior, right? Every action, there's a reason for it. Sometimes those reasons are obvious. You can look at the situation and see it. Other times it has to do with what's going on inside the person, and you can't see it. It's not, it's not obvious to us. But taking the time to really understand, you know, what is that individual doing? What are they getting? Like, what, what's the result of that behavior? Um, how would it work out for them? How would it not work out for them? You really need to look at, you know, put on your best kind of detective glasses and look at that situation in context to, to try to determine what's going on. Um, yeah, it, it's certainly a complicated process. I will, I will definitely agree. Uh, the next question here is about a young grade two student. Um, she's currently in the process of, of getting some assessments done. Um, the, the concern is that she appears to be getting more and more aggressive by the day. Um, she's thinking that other people are saying that other people are mean. Um, she wants to be first at everything. I'm not sure if that's perfectionistic or just she wants to be the first in line. I'm not sure yet. Um, but how can we be more preventative? rather than reactive to emotional outbursts. And maybe that, I think, just sort of focusing on that part of the question, how can we be preventative rather than reactive to this young girl who's got these emotional outbursts? Well, I was a young girl with very intense emotional outbursts, so I will say that. In fact, I will even tell you that the kids learned very quickly that 
they could make me react badly. And so they worked really hard to make me react. They worked really hard to make me freak out because it was funny because Heather would get in trouble. It didn't matter what they did. It wasn't half as bad as the way Heather's going to react. I can even remember like being in the hallway in grade seven, screaming and crying and being completely alone. Nobody comes and sees me. Nobody says anything. They just ignore me. Just leave me out there while I scream and cry. What's my point? My point is that we can, in that moment, there's nothing you can do. In that moment, my nervous system is reacting because it needs to. I have to get all of that emotion out of my system. I have to express it. I have to cry. I have to scream because if I swallow that emotion, it just, it eats me up inside. You can't just keep swallowing it. Sometimes if I swallow it for too long, I have really intense panic attacks. So in the moment, there's almost nothing you can do. But you can look at the triggers. You can figure out what is it that's causing the emotional meltdowns and then try and come up with a plan when the child is calm to proactively find the solution. Because no kid actually wants to freak out at the time. They actually don't like it generally. They know they're not supposed to do it. They know that if they're going to get in trouble. They know it's embarrassing often. So they don't want to do it. But they're doing it because their neurology, their biology, their hormones, they're forcing us into this state. So then as parents, educators, support people, we have to help them stay calmer. We have to help give them more periods of rest during the day. We have to give them a place where their nervous system doesn't get to that place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, what I like about this question, this person's question is it was about being preventative rather than reactive, because more often than not, um, as you know, the, the adults in the room, we tend to expect good behavior uh, and then we get very reactive when we don't see it. Right. Uh, but, we, you know, we get we get punitive, you know, we, we then yeah. punish. Um, and I think that, you know, so kudos to this person for wanting to take that preventative approach there's a couple of things that i would um also share and that is you know more often than not you know heather has talked about like the, you know the the sensory environment and you know we see that with everyone i can only sit in the food court at the mall for about 20 minutes and i'm done like get me out um we all have our our those sensory experiences, things that, that we find uncomfortable that we don't, we don't want to participate in. Um, so sensory, you know, a, a kind of a sensory overload is absolutely an important thing to look at. What's the context in which that student or that individual is in? Is it something that could be an overwhelming context? Could it be overloading their system? If it is, how do you help them get out? How do you help them re-regulate, come down, as you mentioned a moment ago? Another preventative thing as well, just to think about is uh, more often than not, when we see problematic behaviors in anyone, it's often a case of unclear expectations. People don't know what they need to do right. They don't know how to be successful in that situation. They missed a cue. They, they're not sure how to, you know, what to do to be correct, right? And in that moment, you know, I think that, you know, you had a perfect example of, you know, if, if you get upset, um, you shared you like somebody to just sit with you to help you get through it, right? They might not have to do anything, right? I mean, you, you get into it and I, I'm not asking you to, but it's, it's just being there. And that's a moment where rather than telling people what to do, my recommendation would be ask the person what they want you to do. <laughs> what do you need from me in this moment? How do you need me to help you? How do we get through this? Because when somebody's dysregulated, that's not a teachable moment. There's no opportunity for learning there. All there is is an opportunity to get re-regulated. And then after that student, individual, whomever they are, once they're calm, cool, collected, now you can go back and put on your detective glasses, have a conversation. You can figure out what the problem was so you can be pre preventative next time. So really understanding again that context. As just a, a someone who just loves human behavior, um, I will say that when we have problem behavior, problem behavior, whatever you want to define, whatever your personal definition of problem behavior is, whenever we have that, it's usually because there's a mismatch between the skills the individual has and the tools in their toolbox and the demands of the environment at that time. That's why we have problem behavior. It's a, it's a mismatch of skills and environment. So, you know, rather than being reactive which again i appreciate the question because it goes to show that you know they realize a reactive approach isn't working 
what can you do differently next time? How can you set that individual up for success next time? What can you do in changing the environment to make the environment a better fit for them? Um, these are the kinds of, I think, reflections that we'd want to consider. Um, and I think similar to some of the other questions, uh, there's no one, one little thing that if you did that, everything is going to be different. It's usually a combination of different strategies that you have to pull together. Um, somebody here mentioned, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I agree. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak on navigating academia as an autistic person. The context is they're an autistic uh, individual, um, ADHD as well, PhD student, found themselves hitting a wall now uh, that the structure of classes, assignments, etc., is gone, and the focus is on large independent research projects. Uh, dissertation, I know, that's painful. <laughs> With little guidance or instruction or external structure, uh, what have you found helpful in navigating say educational environments let's put this in a bigger context so it's not just for those in grad school but the bigger kind of post-secondary education right we know that there's a shift from high school teachers are still looking over your shoulder they're still providing you know all kinds of support around how to how to work through the assignments and the classes when you get into post-secondary you don't have that no one's looking over your shoulder anymore so what have you found helpful in navigating that you know post-secondary environment? So one thing that really helps me is having a guide. And I always had, so I always went to my learning accessibility office and I would always get like tutors or mentors or people that I could meet with. And I did this even in grad school. So um, when I was at Western, cause that's where I went to grad school, I was actually assigned to work with a disability support worker and they were able to offer tutoring to students with learning disabilities. Now I didn't have a learning disability, obviously I had autism, regardless, I was able to take advantage of the system that was already in place. And so this quote unquote tutor, she was, um, she had a PhD herself, right? So she clearly knew what she was doing, but my quote unquote tutor, um, what we dealt with almost all the time was the executive functioning stuff, right? Like, how do I organize this paper? How should I organize these details? How do I improve the clarity of this section? So it wasn't that she understood the content necessarily of what I was studying, but she could help guide me through all those multitude of decisions. And I don't think I could have done it without her, honestly. Um, especially grad school, because writing is the most difficult task that anyone can do because you've got to organize all of these details into higher order concepts and speak of them clearly and coherently. And that's a lot of work when you can see as many details as many autistics can. So it's not that we can't get there. It's that we see so many details that it takes us so much longer to get there. And so understanding that about myself, understanding that I'm not stuck in the details because I'm unable to understand this material. I'm stuck in the details because I can see so many of them. So I need more time. And so I did. I, I, I sort of built in extra time into many of my assignments and many of my projects. I would take less courses than I was supposed to, so I would have more time. Obviously, that suggests that I have privilege because it's much more expensive to do it that way. And I fully acknowledge that that's not always possible, but that's certainly something that I did to cope. Um, the only other thing that I will say is that I have to create structure for myself because my world is completely unstructured. I teach at home right now because everything's online, although we are going back. Um, everything is almost everything is under my control, which means I never know how to organize anything. What I found really helpful is that idea of shame free accountability. So creating structures for myself, creating due dates, having those due dates shared with other people, whether it's other students I'm working with, other professors, whoever, but having every so committing to doing a task and then having someone know that I committed to doing it is often enough to make sure that I finish it. And then in that small way, I start to make progress. So I say, I'm going to get this done. I then meet with you and have I done it? Well, if I'm not, shame free accountability says, oh, no problem. You'll try again next week. But it's just the fact that I made that intention, I set the goal, I had the structure, and I found that so helpful. So I'm sorry if I talk too long, Shane. What do you think? No, I, that's fantastic. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, I know myself, if I don't put some structure in place, if I don't break a large task down into small bits with due dates, um, you know, when I 
in my day to day with my colleagues, you know, Amy Tatterton, who had uh, introduced you uh, with, you know, my team at Sineve, if I don't break things down, I, you know, due dates and, you know, I make every, make it known to everyone, this is the date that I'm going to have this back to you, or this is the date that I want this from you, things don't happen um, because we're busy, right? And the things that have due dates, you know, tend to be the first things that get done. Things that are a little bit more loose and without structure, no due dates, well, they're the first things to get shoved to the back and, and, and I don't work on them. So, um, no, you know, I think that that's a piece that, um, you know, I, I liked the way that you described neurodiversity. I like the way that you described the brain being more of an ecosystem than a computer. I, I hadn't heard that analogy before. And I'm, that just makes a world of sense. Um, and so when we think about neurodiversity, one of the things that, again, we're acknowledging by the very fact of having that discussion is that we are currently in a, an environment that has a structure that assumes everyone thinks and behaves the same way. And we know that that's not true. You can't, you can't agree with neurodiversity and agree that, oh, everyone should behave the same way and that this is the structure that everyone should fit into, right? It's square peg, round hole, like it just doesn't work. Um, so really thinking about, you know, what are the resources that you think you might benefit from? Where, are, where can you go for help? You, you're, no one is in it alone. There's nothing that we're doing in our day-to-day -day where we are, you know, we're forced to do it by ourselves. So reaching out for that help, the, the assistance that you talked about with um, accessibility services and, and some of the, the learning strategies around executive functioning, that's fantastic. Like, we would all benefit from that. There's, there's no one who wouldn't. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's, that notion of finding the right supports, kind of understanding where you might be struggling. You don't need to know why you're struggling. It's just that, okay, there's, there's something here that's getting in my way and then going and seeking some assistance to try to figure out what that is. Um, again, it's that detective work, right? We've got to do that. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about um, is I love that term finding one spark. Um, and what I wanted to do is, is get your opinion on um, is that the new term for self-stimulatory behaviors or as, you know, often people talk about with younger kids, stims, is right. that the same in your understanding of it? Or, you know, if it's not the same, how are they different? Um, and, you know, yeah, I guess I'll just start there in, in your understanding of spark and stims, are they the same or are they different? So. No, I would say they're different. So for me, my understanding of it, and I'm, and you're welcome to correct me and tell me where you were coming from, but from my understanding of it, most of the stims that I have or that many people that I am um, familiar with engage in, they're mostly about regulating, right? So they're mostly, so what we often have, a, many of us have hyperreactive nervous systems, some of us have underreactive nervous systems, but whether you're on one side or the other, movement is often the way that you, that you either bring yourself up or you can use it to bring yourself down. And so many stims are about that. They're about actually regulating your nervous system. So whereas sparks are more about what you are passionately interested in, if that makes any sense at all. What, what do you think though? No, that, that, that absolutely makes a perfect sense. And, and that's, I wasn't sure, I, like, as I was sort of mulling yeah. this over and thinking about your examples, I'm like, ah, they might be the same. They might be different, but you've clarified for me that, I, yeah, I think they are, they're different things. And I think, um, I'm, I'm glad I brought that up. I was almost going to skip that question, but I'm glad I brought it up because, you know, when I think about, um, stims, uh, in general, that is something, and, and, Again, it's, it's my own baggage coming from the early intervention world that is inspiring this question, but there's a lot of, um, I'll say kind of standard operating procedure that people think that, oh, well, you know what, uh, people shouldn't stim, uh, we shouldn't allow stims, or so we're going to stim, we're going to have sensory breaks at, you know, on the, on the tens, or we're going to do it, you know, once an hour, sensory, and, you know, again, I, I've, 
I've had a career of working in schools, being a, a, a like a contractor to schools, and I love that work. So this isn't a, um, you know, I, I'm not criticizing the schools, but what I often find within these institutions are that they will say, well, let's go to the sensory room at two o'clock because that's when break coverage needs to happen. And your point was exactly what I wanted to tap into is that stims are about self-regulation. So who am I to say when that person should be like when they need whatever the thing is that they need to regulate, whether you're over aroused or under aroused, you know, we all are desiring to be in that optimal zone. Um, you know, for me to say that at two o'clock is the time that we're going to go have this movement break, that doesn't make any sense in considering when people actually need that movement break. One person might need it every 10 minutes, the other person might need it every two hours. So the idea of scheduling it so it's on the clock makes no sense to me. And an analogy that just really resonates for me is if I said to the coffee drinkers, attending today that I am now taking control of your coffee. What is coffee? It's a stimulant. It's because you're under aroused. You wake up in the morning. You want to, you know, get up to that optimal zone. If I said to you, I'm going to take control of your coffee consumption. And now you have to drink your day's worth of coffee at 7 PM at night. Is that going to work for you? Right? Putting your self-regulation, it wouldn't be self-regulation. It's just a regulation strategy, but putting that on the clock doesn't make sense. It's not, there, there's no reason why that's going to work for the individual. And so I think thinking about STEM as something that's regulation and it's different than a spark um, makes sense to me. And again, I, I'm, I'm thankful you hit that notion or you hit the idea that a STEM is about regulation. It's not about a passion. Those are two different things. Um, I could see some people just given my history and in, in intervention programs that there might be some questions there. So I wanted to address that or, and I'm glad I did. I almost didn't. So thank you. Your, your answer no, was exactly no what I was hoping for. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so at this point now we're at 830. Um, this is when we were uh, scheduled to end. Um, there have been no other new questions in the, uh, the chat. So I feel like we've either um, addressed them all or people were speechless now as they were when you've stopped talking and that I found myself to be speechless. Um, I want to thank everyone for spending their evening with us. Um, please visit the Sine Family Foundation uh, website, sinefoundation.org. We offer a variety of programs and services to support individuals on the spectrum, families, professionals. You can sign up for our newsletter uh, to stay on top of our work. And we offer presentations like this one here tonight on a monthly basis. Um, we offer a variety of different um, community connection activities. So please, you know, visit the website, see what interests you. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. Happy to connect. Um, and a huge thank you to you, Heather. Uh, this has been a fantastic night. Um, I'm, I love this topic. I feel like I, we could continue for another couple of hours, but we all want to go to bed, I'm sure. Um, right. So, yes, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, please stay tuned, and we hope to see you uh, next month for our next workshop. Um, have a good night, everyone.